The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus said, But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them. Do to others as you would have done them to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and land, expecting nothing when you turn. Your reward will be great, and your children of the Most High, who is kind and ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your God is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put in your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you give back the gospel of our Lord. In today's reading, we have Jesus telling us to love our enemies and to do good to those who hate us. As gospel readings go, this seems to be classic Jesus. This is a message, this is a message we have all heard before that we have internalized as Christians. We know these hearts, we know these words in the depth of our being. This is what it means to be Christian, to love our enemies and to do good to those who hate us, to do good to those who persecute us. If there were a script that was given to Christians, if there were lines that were written to capture the heart of what it meant to be Christian, these lines might be part of that script. In this way, this reading kind of reminds me of Martin Luther King's Ivory Dream speech. Like Jesus' words that we should love our enemies, Martin Luther King's words from that speech are etched into the fabric of our lives. For those of us who have been born in the U.S., they are encoded in our memory. Phrases like, I have a dream that my children will not be judged, by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, and phrases like, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out to the true meaning of its creed. Phrases like this are imprinted on our minds, they become part of our nation's story, indeed they become part of our story. Because these words play such a large role in our story, it is almost as if Martin Luther King did not say anything else in his life. It is almost as if his life is encapsulated in a few of these quotes. It is almost as if we can boil down the essence of his life into these phrases. But of course, to do this, to remember the life of Martin Luther King Jr. by only looking at a few of these phrases would be to do a disservice to his legacy. <clears throat> Every year around Martin Luther King Day in January, politicians often like to quote Martin Luther King. And when they do, they naturally quote some of these phrases. They quote Martin Luther King 
to say that we should treat each other not based on the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. They say that Martin Luther King wanted us to live in the colorless society, a society that's beyond race. But in doing so, they misinterpret and they misread what his life was ultimately about. And so this year, when this happened, Martin Luther King III, Martin Luther King's son, made the point that these politicians often quote his father while also tearing down the legacy of what his father fought for. They make a show about quoting Martin Luther King before targeting voting rights, the very voting rights that were gained by the civil rights movement. They act as if they're supporting the man before working to undermine his legacy. Martin Luther King III argued that these politicians who do this did not really understand his father at all. Like the example of Martin Luther King in the I Have a Dream speech, I think we can also run the risk of treating our text from today as if it was all there was to Jesus' teaching. This can be difficult for Christians. This can be difficult for Christians because this text has often been read in a way that calls for passivity on the part of the Christian. It can be difficult to Christians because this text can be often read in a way that calls for passivity in the part of the Christian. Sometimes people, people think that to turn the other cheek and to love your enemies is to act meekly in the face of violence and oppression. This interpretation of the text has been especially damaging to women over the years who have been told that they are to forgive others when they are treated badly. It can also be damaging to persons of color, to Christians of color, who have been told that they should turn the other cheek in the face of white supremacist violence. So two things happen when Christians are told that they should turn the other cheek. The first thing that happens is that Christians lose the agency to fight back against the oppression that they face. Instead, they are, they are silenced by the oppressor, and this can continue and does continue the cycle of injustice and violence. The second thing that happens when the teachings and actions of Jesus are frozen into place, they are turned into a theme, into a slogan. Like Martin Luther King in the Eye of a Dream speech, if we remember Jesus for just this one thing, as a, we can um, remember Jesus just for this one thing, as, a, as one who forgives in the face of violence. However, we know that Jesus is much more than the one who simply forgives in the face of violence. Jesus Christ is the one who liberates. Jesus Christ is the one who stands in solidarity with those who suffer and the one who empowers them to change their situation. Because of the way that this force has been used against women throughout history, feminist biblical scholars have paid special attention to this force. Aware of the ways that this force has been used against women, the feminist biblical scholar Shelley Matthews writes, that Jesus is not asking for allowing the beast to continue. She writes, a woman who is repeatedly beaten by a husband, for example, shows love only when she seeks help for both herself and her husband to break the cycle of violence. Although this scholar is talking about violence that the man inflicts on the woman, we should point out that the same pattern of violence, the same dynamic of violence can happen in the course of any relationship. In heterosexual relationship, in homosexual relationships, even relationships between different groups of people. The point here is that this text is talking about something more. This text is talking about patterns of relationships in cycles of violence. And by instructing us to forgive those who have harmed us, Jesus shows a way of breaking violence into which we are caught. 
of breaking the cycle of violence into which we are caught. As Jesus goes on to say in verse 34, even sinners reciprocate what is given to them. If a sinner is treated with harm, they reciprocate with harm. If a sinner is treated with favor, they reciprocate with favor. So part of what Jesus is doing, he gives us a path forward, a way to break out the cycle of violence and hatred that so characterizes much of our life today. And this is what Martin Luther King himself understood. This is why the concept of nonviolence became so revelatory in the midst of violence. To show love in the face of violence was a way of flipping the script on the white supremacists. It was a way of calling out the norms and values of the, of the society into question by disrupting those values themselves. But this text indeed goes even further. It would be one thing if Jesus merely told us how we should act in certain situations. It would be one thing if this text told us how to act in the, in the midst of violence. But there is even more that is going on in this text. What Jesus does in this text is he presents us with a vision of God's kingdom. As part of its preaching, Jesus sets up a counter vision of the world. Jesus would preach about the world not as it is, but as it should be. And here Jesus is presenting us a vision of the world as it should be. The world that is based on love rather than fear, a world that is based on mercy and justice rather than retribution or retaliation. Jesus presents a world that reminds us that we are loved because of who we are, not because of what we do or how much money is in our bank account. And so here Jesus is setting up a counter vision that calls us to examine the world around us. Jesus' illustration of the world based on love naturally leads us to judge the world in which we live. Jesus' message leads us to look around to see how the world measures up to the world he proclaims. And because he knows that when we look at the world around us, we see a world of violence and greed, but rather than getting down on the world, Jesus' proclamation of a better world based on love leads us to work to improve it. This means that in Jesus' proclamation of a better world, we hear the call to work towards that better world. And in this way, we are called to live into this better world. And so that is a call to live into this better world by acting as if Jesus' uh, proclamation were true. This is the call, this is the act. May we be bold enough to enter into it. Amen.